Have you ever wondered what goes through an experienced agent's mind when they are looking at a bunch of different offers and deciding what to recommend to their seller? Have you ever wondered exactly what the pros and cons of each offer type are so that way you actually know what to lead your seller to? Well, if you've ever wanted any of that insight, this show is for you because... I am sharing the the sequel to the experience that I just had with the highest and best and 17 offers and all of that stuff. This is the part two. And we dive into the insight of the brains of Allie and myself and what we think when we receive offers and how we talk to sellers about it. So if that sounds interesting, stay tuned. Welcome to the Agent Goldmine, the only podcast in the world specifically for real estate agents who are stuck at five transactions a year to help them get to 20 plus. Your hosts, Ali Garced and Shelby Johnson, two EXP icon agents, each do over 40 transactions a year and interview others who are crushing it. In this podcast, you'll receive the knowledge to help you scale your business using systems and processes with our interviews and monologues twice a week. If you want to be a part of our community, reach out. Welcome to the show. Update time. As some of you know, from a couple shows ago, I had my first listing in Lexington go live. We had a fuck ton of people at our open house. We had 17 offers. The winning offer was cash, 40 grand over list. And you know, as a normal reintroduction into real estate, it would not work unless there was a roller coaster involved because real estate is just a roller coaster of highs and lows and you're just trying to hold on and stay steady throughout the process. So real estate transactions welcomed me back with her arms wide open and said, Shelby, you know what? This was too easy. We are going to make sure that it's tougher for you by having that cash buyer at 40 grand over say, you know, goodbye without negotiating, without coming back. You know, they did an inspection and um, it really wasn't like the, their inspection's not bad. <laughs> um, so I think that there was like an issue with the partnership behind the scenes with an LLC buyer um, that they like didn't agree, whatever. They just ended up walking. I tried to get them to, you know, come back. Hey, let's fucking play ball here. Nope. But that's okay. Because luckily, you know, we had 136 leads that we had captured from our mark. And by the way, if you have not seen that, listen to the episode that I'm talking about, you should definitely listen. And let me find the name of that. Okay. So if you do not know what I'm talking about, that is episode 136. Go and listen to it. That is the, the prelude to the story that I'm about to tell. But the takeaway of today is that if you do all the marketing, this is not actually a takeaway. This is the, the first takeaway. If you do a bunch of marketing and you do a great job capturing your leads, if something does happen where a buyer walks for whatever, it's not as big of a deal because you had 16 other people who already offered on this property. You also, in our, my case, we captured 136 interested parties through our CRM, through our marketing campaign. And I was like, you know what? This is actually better. This is another tip. It is a lot of how you... Um, present the narrative to yourself, but also to the client. I could have been like, fuck, this sucks. Oh my God. Now we have to start over. Oh my God. But now it's like, no, this is amazing. Now we have a copy of the home inspection. Now we can send it out to all inter interested parties in advance. And then our offer, in theory, we should be able to get in as is offer. And we won't have those negotiations down the road. We can do all of our negotiations up front and have smooth sailing, like in theory. And you know, that's just a takeaway. If you're ever in a situation where you're like, God, this fucking sucks. Think about the positive spin on it. Tell that spin to yourself, embody the narrative. And then if you have a seller, it is, you know, part of your responsibility to help them see the positive and <laughs> keep those emotions level, level. Don't let them think that you, you know, fucked up. The situation sucks. It's like positive, positive, positive. Does that make sense? Allie nodded once. Yes. And, okay. and yeah. there's like that delicate balance too. If you don't want to be too positive, cause then it's like, wait, what this sounds a little sus, you know, like, so just follow Shelby's lead. Shelby's the word Smith queen. <laughs> that is actually a really good point. When I say positive, 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 I mean, you also have to be realistic, like, you know, real talk yeah. with the positive outlook on it. But anyway, the, to bring it all the way back, what we're going to talk about today actually is in a, in a situation, if you are a newer or even more seasoned agent and you are in a position where you are, have multiple offers, or maybe you don't have multiple offers. Maybe you're just looking to accept 
you know, one offer. The intent of today's show is to be able to help you understand the pros and cons and things to consider with each offer type. And Allie doesn't know, but this is an interactive, like I want her opinion on this too, because I have my perspective. And so she and I are going to just like fucking off the cuff, talk about the different types of offers, things to consider, um, et cetera. (laughs) So with that, I'm excited. Oh my God. Okay. (laughs) With that, So the offers that came in, I'm not going to go through all of them, but we're going to go through a couple. So there were a couple cash offers. There were a couple conventional offers. And then there was your primary resident type of offer. We had VA and both FHA who offered on this property. So let's actually start from FHA and work our way back. So when you are, we can do FHA and VA, you know, together with this to paint the picture. This is a duplex. And right now it is fully tenant occupied, but one side is on a 12 month lease. The other side is month to month. And so the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's fully occupied. Some people are like, oh, this a VA or FHA buyer can't buy this property because it's tenant occupied and that's a primary residence loan. Well, in case you didn't know, um, confirm with your lender always. But generally, if buyer can occupy the property within 60 days following closing, then it's all good. So if the unit that is month to month is month to month, then a VA or FHA buyer can come in, buy the property, give notice, 30-day notice, that person moves in, and then they have time to also move into the property, no issue. So all you have to do is provide the lender with a copy of the lease showing that it's month to month. And Allie, did I fuck up any of those numbers? Because I said 60 days. Is there... She's like, no, it's 90 days, you dumb shit. (laughs) What is it, Allie? Uh, (laughs) I think it it is 60 days for FHA. But fun fact, with the VA, you can extend it. It's actually... It actually does not say 60 days in the reg. It says a reasonable amount of time. So a couple of my clients who are like PCSA from overseas. <laughs> yes, dude. They literally <laughs> um, moved in four to five months after. So they're a reasonable amount of time could be in this case, um, you know, giving the the current tenant enough time to find a new home. So it could go past 60 days. It could go all the way up to 180 days, I believe. Yeah. So, so that's for the VA for FHA. I'm actually not, not sure. I'm sure it is 60. And always check with your lender. And if your lender for any reason tells you, let's say even less than 180, you know, like Ali just said, then reach out to Ali or I, we have lender, you know, people that we could recommend. But my thing is some lenders don't fucking know. You can't trust anyone. (laughs) You can't trust anyone. So if they're like, no, that can't be done. That's a red flag in my brain because the right lender partner will say, I'm not sure. Let me confirm. I'm sure there's a way that we can figure this out. Like that's the difference of what you should be listening for. So with the VA FHA, that is, this is the situation here. It's duplex, blah, blah, blah. And the condition of the property, it's, it's not bad. It's built in 1960 and it's very conducive with what a 1960 property would look like that hasn't been like fully renovated and gutted and updated. But let's talk about if I am the seller, hypothetically, and I have these types of offers on the table, what are the things that I should be considering if I'm looking at a VA FHA buyer versus conventional or cash? And I don't want to like put you on the spot. So I'll just say some things first. But um, things that I was considering is that there will be an appraisal (laughs) as opposed to cash, which obviously cash is king. You're not always going to get cash offers. But I did not personally like the sound of an appraisal for this specific property because there are not a lot of comps that justify pricing. And appraisers, just like the lender situation I told you about, no one fucking knows what they're doing. Literally, everyone is out there just making it up. And so it's very like, you know, luck of the draw with the type of appraiser and what they're going to, first of all, value the property at. And then second of all, come back. Some people are like, oh, it's all good. Like no repairs required. But with VA and FHA, those are generally the ones that are most likely to come back with appraisal required repairs. If there is hypothetically, you know, paint chipping because it's an older property or there's not a handrail for over what three steps or whatever, or there's like a crack in the driveway that could be a safety hazard. Like these are all things that you won't get on a cash offer that you might get on VA, FHA. Another thing with VA and FHA, because 
although they're not supposed to be location specific, everything is kind of location specific. And so something that might be helpful for you is I reached out to, I had a lender, I had an icon. Remember episodes ago, I was like, how do I learn about this area? I'm going to find an icon agent who an EXP, that means they've closed a shit ton of deals. I'm going to reach out to them, ask them to coffee, become their best friend, whatever, ask them a ton of questions. So that agent recommended lenders to me, of course, local lenders. And I connected with one of the local lenders and she's fucking so good, like on her shit. She has cheat sheets for everything. And so when I first met with her, I was like, dude, cheat sheets. I love cheat sheets. You do too. Oh my God. Send me everything you have. And one of the, one of the things she sent me was um, re- things to expect for each type of appraisal, which I thought was amazing. Like no lender has sent me that before. And it literally has like FHA, USDA, VA, and there's like bullets of what you need to expect for each loan type for each appraisal, (laughs) which is great. Whoa. And I can upload. Yeah, That is so cool. Oh my gosh. Can we talk about that? Yeah. I mean, I can also upload it into my tool. Would you like to? Yes. Okay. I'll be the first one to download it. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Yeah. And so, I mean, we can go through it if you want, or we can just upload it and you can look at it later. I think since we're on the topic, let's, let's go through it. Let's go through it. F-A- okay. Let's, so since yeah. I used FHA and VA in my example, and since we have a lot of VA listeners, let's, we'll just go through the VA one. So in particular, her little ch- checklist said, you know, pest inspections, which is true. The, the, you know, VA requires a pest inspection. It must be done and paid by um, the buyer on, wait, hold on, which um, must be done and can be paid by the buyer on the closing disclosure. And the reason why the can is in there is because back in the day, it used to, the seller was required required to pay for the pest inspection. That rule has now changed. Um, the VA has a separate set of qualified appraisers that they circulate through. This is on her little list. Um, another bullet is all peeling paint on windowsills and outbuildings must be remedied. A water test is required if the appraiser requests. This goes back to the whole thing where it's so luck of the draw with (laughs) what appraiser you get. Um, Well and septic locations and distances must be documented. Crawl space and attic accessible for head and shoulders inspections. And the last one is safety items such as handrails must be present or installed. So this is just, I mean, none of it's like mind blowing, but it is a cute, good little, you know, reminder of things to consider. And then the reason why this is important, guys, is if you do have an older property that has, you know, chipping pain and not the missing handrails and your seller is like, hypothetically, this is not the case with my seller. Like he's awesome. But some people are like, I'm not fucking doing anything. And like, you just know that it's going to be annoying, a problem, tricky. These are things you're going to want to consider because even in this case, like in the case of our second highest and best, the FHA offer (laughs) was a top contender in regard to the amount they offered. But with that, There's going to be appraisal. We don't know if it'll appraise. And there was no appraisal gap. So what happens when it comes in under and they're like, well, it came in under. I guess you have to draw a price because we're not going to pay anything over. More things to consider. That's the same thing with the the VA. Um, And for this in particular, the FHA was requesting 3% buyer commission and $8,000 in closing costs. So just because they offered one of the highest amounts does not mean that that is the one that when you're talking to your seller, no. You, you, first of all, you're never going to tell him what to do. But this is kind of a second part of what I wanted to talk about today, understanding your seller's personality and what type of communication they like. Because if you have... This goes back to the DISC assessment, which I've talked about at some point. Um, if you have like a high C, detail-oriented, wants to know you know, all of the, like wants to follow the rules, all the details, all the stuff versus a high D, which is like, just give me the fucking point. Like, tell me, you know, bottom line, you are going to communicate and present offers to those different clients differently. Does that make sense? If you're looking to change brokerages this year so you can increase your business and you want to join us at eXp Realty and would like either myself, Ali Garced, or Shelby Johnson to personally sponsor you in, so that way you have access to two icon agents, text the word JOIN to either my number, 914-318-4918, or Shelby's number, 859-267-3849. If I sponsor you and you have access to the both of us and everything that's Five Pillars Nation, we have the checklist, the systems, the processes to help you scale your business. And don't take our word for it. 
We've had agents switch brokerages to join us that were stuck making $300,000 GCI and they join us so they can scale. So text the word join to those numbers and we'll take the next steps. Um, okay. With, when it comes to appraisals in Kentucky, do, do the appraisers have access to the contract and see how much the they're under contract for? That's a great question. And fuck if I know, because this is my first, <laughs> this is my first, um, and both my buyers are cash, you know, like my first one okay. that fell through yeah. was cash and now this one's cash. <laughs> so I don't know, but that's a good question. I'm going to write that down. Continue your thought. You have a purpose. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One thing that I, so in Arizona they do, which I always found and along with, I think Colorado, it doesn't matter. Um, the States that do, I don't know how I feel about that. You know, like why should the appraiser get a little a glimpse into what it's going for? I feel like the appraisers, my feeling, my opinion on this doesn't really matter, but I don't really feel like a, appraisers should be getting the, okay, well, what did you guys decide? Okay. Because, because the, the appraiser almost always like 90% of the time comes back at the exact amount that we negotiated, like to the 20th dollar, you know, like I feel some type of way about appraisers getting a little, um, glimpse. I feel like we're just giving them the amount for them to say, yeah, sure. I can see that. And my work here is done as opposed to them actually finding the comps and saying, no, you guys are actually under contract for a little bit too low or a little bit too high. So again, like you said, appraisers, like luck of the draw, man, like what type of appraiser are you going to get? Um, and so generally speaking, if you, if you do know the appraiser or if the lender knows the appraiser, um, if they done work with them before, they'll kind of know if they're like, do they really, do they do stuff a little bit below or, or right on par or are they appraising a little bit high, but but chances of you getting the same appraiser, I mean, there's a reason that lenders don't hire the appraiser anymore. <laughs> right. So, uh, which is a good thing. Literally for which this, is a good thing. where it's like, <laughs> no, because dude, of this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Because it's 2008. <laughs> um, so this does actually bring up a memory that happened of this one girl, the first round who offered like an outrageous amount and her argument, she's the agent. She's like, the inspectors will just put whatever's on the contract anyway, which means that they do see the contract in the state of Kentucky. Cause she, yeah, she was like, they literally don't even run numbers. They're just going to put whatever's on the contract. So interesting. Damn. I'm so glad we have to we pay should for those appraisers. Reports. Maybe <laughs> I know. Yeah, yeah. I know. And like, wait around. Well, not us, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. <laughs> Anything else on things to consider? Okay. The, one more thing to consider with Ooh, I have these. One thing. Okay. Yes. VA and FHA being that they're going to be owner, chances are um, that they're more owner occupied properties. In this case, as a listing agent, um, chances are that the buyers are a little bit more emotional. You know, like they either need a place to live or they want that place to live. Um, but it's different. I feel like there's a little bit more emotional buy-in on the property as opposed to investors that are just like, oh, you know what? Uh, I'd rather have a higher ROI elsewhere. Um, so in that case, I think that's that that's a plus for the VA and the FHA loans. Oh, that's so interesting because I actually, right, as you were like, oh, I got one more, one more. I was also like, oh, I got one more. I was actually going to say it was a con because what I what I what I view in this is that the people who are buying it to occupy will care a lot more about like you said the emotions they're going to care more about like the condition in theory and like you know oh that tenant's moving out but I have to move in and now that I mean they've lived in it for a year this it, true story I mean they have lived in it for like fucking 10 years um whereas the investor is like fuck I mean I'm not going to live in it I'll just keep those tenants in, whatever. Fuck it. So I don't know. It does. It, uh, it, who knows? Dude. Okay. I yeah. see your point. So, so yeah, well, I think they both, they both apply, you know, like the, the home buyer is chances are it's going to be a strong, like a stickier offer, but because they're going to be the ones living in it, the inspection report, whatever it's called, they're going to be asking for more. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Cool. 
All fun things to consider. Okay, so those were really our primary residence type of things. So now with conventional is our other little grouping. These are our investors who are buying with generally 25% down. You know, of course, we had the one who was like, let's do creative. And the one who was like, can I assume the loan? And, you know, we have all those people do. But I'm just talking about for this case scenario, the conventional 25% down. We and with that, my thought process for, for that is our two strongest conventional buyers were out of state and had never seen the property themselves. And even though they had one of them, even though they had the inspection report, did not want to waive the inspections, which by the way, so far, the VA and FHA had both waived inspections because they'd already seen the report, which is strong for them. But um, they still had the financing contingency. So we're not free and clear. These conventional guys, one of them waived further inspecting. One of them kept the inspection contingency. And both of them had financing contingencies, which means, again, we're dealing with an appraisal. I don't think that it would have you know, as much re- required repairs potentially, but we're still dealing with that. And the other thing that I didn't love about that is that they had not seen the property. They weren't familiar with the area. And sometimes this goes back to our scenarios like, is it a pro or is it a con? Because it could be both. Because a lot of times like those fucking buyers out of (laughs) California or even like wherever, West Coast, they see Kentucky or North Carolina, you know, numbers. And they're like, oh my God, I can get a duplex for $250,000. Like I can't get like a hut under the bridge for $250,000 in, you know, California or whatever. So there's like that where they're like, oh, you know, like, fuck it. This is not serious money. But then there's the flip side, which both of these investors weren't the ones that had like millions in the bank. They were like trying to get in the game. They had like a couple of rentals, but they weren't like super seasoned. Um, those scare me too, because it's like, you're not super seasoned. You're you, there's, you might be skittish. You don't have fuck you money. So this money counts more to you. (laughs) And I'm not saying that you shouldn't expect, accept these offers. Like any of them so far could have been great offers. I'm just saying this is how my brain worked to explain my thought process when, you know, looking at all the offers. So that way, hopefully someone listening can find some value and insight from this. But that's what I was feeling with those conventional offers. Um, I do like there's more skin in the game. You know, they had down payments. They're like, you know, But anyway, so that's kind of, I don't really have anything else. I don't think with conventional, what are your thoughts when you see a conventional out of state investor come in on a property? It's, it definitely doesn't put me in as much ease as, well, I I always ask how many properties they've purchased before, you know, like to try to find out, are they seasoned or are they not? Because if they're first or second or even third time, then like forget about that. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. It hurts. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I would much rather go with just like the freaking, it, you know, if, if all of their terms and conditions are the same, I'd rather go with the homeowner. Um, that may be more picky. Um, I'm curious. So between like the, all the financed offers, lender, VA, FHA, um, did any lenders call you, email you or text you to give you the feel good about their clients? One, only, only one out of everyone. And it wasn't even in the first round at all. It was only in the second round. We got one call and it was the FHA buyer who asked for way too much compared to the rest, the 3% plus the eight grand. They're like, Oh, he's such a good buyer. I'm like, dude, I mean, and he's like, does he have a shot? And I'm like, I mean, no, (laughs) I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But like, thanks for calling. I love that. (laughs) Nice to meet you. (laughs) Yeah. But yeah, the point is one and you're totally right. Cause your guy calls every time, doesn't he? Uh, yes, like 100%. I don't even have to ask, you know, like he knows the offer. He knows the address. He can look up the listing agent. I don't even need to tell him who the listing agent is. Chances are he has a relationship with them already. So it's just like, it's such a big help to work with a lender that already is established yet, yet like not to the level where they're going to pawn you off to their assistant, you know, like that, that really, really good medium that has a good reputation. Um, and because of that, they the upfront work for your buyers is going to be a bitch because they have a lot of work to do, you know, because otherwise Matt is not going to put his reputation on the line. Um, and another thing too, of what I have recently come across is when, when financed offers, again, this is probably maybe just in Arizona, but maybe helps in other States too. When a finance offer is placing a, a, or finance buyers placing an offer 
that is higher than what the list price is in states where appraisers look at the contract, not only do they see the contract price, but they also see what it listed for. So they kind of see that delta and like how big is the difference going up or down. Um, so another like kind of sneaky, but also not that sneaky way to do it is if you get uh, uh, an offer that is higher, you could always change the list price to match that amount before accepting the offer. So that way the the appraiser goes and sees okay the the you know purchase price is 400 the the amount that they co- went under contract for is 400 no delta Sneaky. there you know perfect. yeah i love it so you could you could do that very cool that's something i've never done before but i just wrote it down my little alley notes over here um very cool love that um, okay. And then with these offers, one did have a pretty good escalation and the other one didn't. So that's, I mean, we're not seeing this across the board from what I've heard. I mean, this is my first listing in Lexington. <laughs> but um, in this particular, because of all the marketing and it's, you know, a duplex and a great zip code, we did get quite a few escalation clauses and a couple appraisal gaps, which are all great, but they're all great. Only if you don't get exactly what you want in the form of cash, which is like so it's hard to, you know, hard to say when you're working with those buyers who like don't have any other option. But we had um, this time around, we had two contenders that were cash. And one of the cash asked for, this sounds shitty, one asked for a buyer's agent commission. And um, that was it. <laughs> and then the other one asked for nothing. Literally, it was three grand higher. They asked for literally nothing, no inspections, no appraisal, close in two weeks. And he didn't have an agent. And the thing is, too, I mean, the dude was super high D personality, which I fucking love me some high Ds. Um, yeah. <laughs> at least I don't say real estate. Yes. Sounds, <laughs> sounds really bad. <laughs> but he called me and he's like, well, because in great, by the way, this all came from follow up. This is why the agent keeping track of the leads, the opportunities, doing as soon as it fell out, I did a mass blast to every single person who ever outreached about the property through follow up boss. And then I can see who opened it. I can sort be who opened it. And I saw the ones who didn't open it. So I texted them all through follow up boss being like, hey, such an email. I see you didn't open it, whatever, blah, blah. And then reached out to everyone who offered previously being like, yo, amazing opportunity. Got the home inspection. This is your chance. The universe, you know, it's aligned. It's for you. This guy, um, he would not have, he did offer the first time, but it was like really a verbal. Um, but this was due to my follow-up that it circled back. So I do, I feel really proud about that. (laughs) I'm like, this is not just, I didn't just put it on the MLS. It's like, I'm busting my ass as a listing agent to get the best, you know, stuff for my client. But anyway, So he is, you know, cash. And we talked about non-refundable. It's because since there are no contingencies, his earnest money is non-refundable, which is great. 2,500 bucks off the bat if he does, you know, and he was like, yo, I don't want to mess around. Like I'm here to close, you know, look me up. Here's my LLC, which I did. I looked him up and he has several other properties. He sent me proof of funds right away. And it's like, you know, a couple million. (laughs) So I'm like, okay, that's fine. We I accept. Um, and quick close. And actually, he did. He said, close whenever your your seller wants. So when I laid them all out on my multiple offer worksheet, which I uploaded last time, episode 136, tools, the multiple offer worksheet, it's very clear to see because it lays out all the price, all the terms, all the things to consider, and then you know has the little net offer at the bottom. And it was easy. I just. And I know my seller's personality type. So I just sent him an email being like, hey, clear winner. Here's the boom, 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 boom. Do you want to hop on a call to discuss or do you want to roll with this? And he just texted me like, let's roll. And then he's like, good job. And I'm like, thank you. Oh my God, That's where's your affirmation? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Is that That's your love language? language? That's my love language. Oh. Just tell me I'm great. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, everyone fine. follow her. She's the Shelby Show on Instagram and give her some words of affirmation. <laughs> uh, um, well, no, it's, that, it means more when like you bust your ass for it. Not, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and, and you did. So, like, okay, I do want to talk about the escalation offers. I'm curious as to what the escalation terms were, even though you didn't, ex- you didn't, you know, go with the financed. Mm-hmm. 
If you are looking to change brokerages this year so you can increase your business and you want to join us at eXp Realty and would like either myself, Ali Garced, or Shelby Johnson to personally sponsor you in, so that way you have access to two icon agents, text the word JOIN to either my number, 914-318-4918, or Shelby's number, 859-267-3849. If I sponsor you and you have access to the both of us and everything that's Five Pillars Nation, we have the checklist, the systems, the processes to help you scale your business. And don't take our word for it. We've had agents switch brokerages to join us that were stuck making $300,000 GCI and they join us so they can scale. So text the word join to those numbers and we'll take the next steps. Yeah. Yeah. So um, for example, we had one that and this is across well actually i'll just talk about the one the one that we did here that's easy in front of me so it's escalation up to 265 well it doesn't matter so over list there was like twenty five thousand dollars over list but the way that escalation works is that you have to provide proof of other offers in order to justify whatever value you're telling them so like if there was an escalation up to 265 and i was like yo dude like we're using all of it I would have to show an offer to him of up to 264 because the way the escalation, it's usually in chunks of a thousand. And so that's it. But if, if only, you know, if it was like $20,000 less, then they wouldn't use the full 265. It would be like, you know, whatever, 246 or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Does it okay. make sense? <laughs> do you guys have those in Tucson? No, it does. We do. Okay. We do. Yeah. Um, but we just aren't seeing them as much right now. Uh, but also, yeah, I don't know. We're, we're not seeing it as much right now, but oh, granted, I don't, I don't work multifamily. So like, I'm sure if I did multifamily, yeah, they're cause they're only like 14 <laughs> in Tucson. So, and none of them are in good condition. So, but they still get a lot of offers. Okay. Some, some real quick tips with the, and Ali and I, we both talked about this before, but like if there's an agent involved, stock the agent. You do not want, if, if given the option, you don't want to work with the agent who's closed one in the past five years versus the one who closed five last month because that person is a fucking closer versus the one who's like, oh, what is real estate again? I don't remember. Um, so that's something. But also like stock the client. Like in this case, the guy who talked the high D on the phone, like who talked a big game, I was like, okay, bro. But I make sure I pull him up. You know what I mean? Like I stock his LLC. I see there's so, so many properties in that LLC. Um, and I'm like, okay, I mean, you do close, you know? So that's all the little tips is make sure you do your homework. Did you go, where did you find the LLC information? Oh, I knew you were going to ask me that. Um, I used, uh, www.drake.com. <laughs> Drake. <laughs> Drake is like the best. I mean, he's not my assistant at all, but he's like very, very helpful. Cause I'm like, yo, can you look this up? And he's like, nerd. here you go. And then it was with the, you know, with the, buyer who he doesn't have an agent so i was like drake will you please just write the offer for us please <laughs> and he's like fine and he like wrote the offer i was like thank god i don't want to do that um but that's the other thing cool too is that up front i told the seller it's in my listing agreement too where it's like you know we charge three percent for our services but if we do procure the buyer and they don't have an agent we do get four percent so that's nice too because it's like an extra little one percent little chunk with this one oh, versus nice. the last one so yeah that's nice Good, good. Um, yeah, cause so, sometimes I, I think every county and state does this differently, but sometimes you are able to just look up the LLC and like the county records, or like the, the treasury, what do you call it? The assessor, the assessor website. So Google your county assessor website and depending on the state, you know, in, in Arizona, you can find it. You can see how many properties each LLC owns as long as you have the LLC name. Um, so Okay, that is all I have for today. Allie, any questions? So everyone can go on theagentgoldmine.com to get the cheat sheet from the lender that has the um, the specific notes as to what each appraiser type calls out. Um, so that way there are no surprises for you. And also, uh, you mentioned to previous episode, you have the um, multiple offer sheets. So that way you can give a pretty presentation to your sellers. So that way you're not confusing them. You're not confusing yourself. Everything is uh, black and white on that screen. So go on the agentgoldmine.com, hit up the Shelby show with any more questions. I'm Allie, the agent, be a bro and share this show. Does that make sense? 100%. <sighs> uh, one um yeah. one thing are you okay? 
Oh, no, no, no. I do this thing where sometimes oh. I don't breathe enough. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a low priority for me, you know? <laughs> I don't know, like $400,000. 400. Delete that. I can't even fucking talk. <laughs> so I don't want to delete anything of your bloopers. They're so fun. <laughs> oh, sorry. Go on. Um, um, I don't know where I was going with this. Go ahead. Okay. Blacked out. Perfect. Um, in love me some Heidi's. Um, <laughs> Yeah. At least I don't say real estate. Yes. Sounds, <laughs> sounds really bad. <laughs> but he called me and he's Put like, that at the beginning of the episode, Rev. Make that the highlight. <laughs> <laughs> um, he called me and he's like, yo, look, 